Welcome and aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, really glad to have you with us. Always lots of things to pay attention to and think about. Hey, we wish we could have you folks connected with us in ways that would enable us to all interact, but hey, we're not there yet. So fortunately today we have with us retired Hawaii Judge Sandra Sims, also author of one book and another one in the works, as I understand it. And David Larson, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in the Twin Cities and the recent past director of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, the largest and leading organization of mediators, arbitrators, and conflict resolvers I think anyway. Uh, so thanks so much, Sandra and David, for joining us. Uh, lots of things going on. Uh, we have some general topics, rights at risk, and maybe some changing tides. Uh, but what do you think might be some of our most important rights at risk as we're looking at things now? Sandra? Well, I, I, I don't I see a couple of things. Actually, I see a couple of things. One, of course, I think, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, women's rights, those issues are certainly in the, in, in the, in the flux at this point. There's so much uncertainty and there's so much, um, um, inconsistency across states. And, and I think that's going to be something that's going to, really affect the November elections. I don't know that that was the original plan, but it certainly is now um, because we're looking at, particularly for the younger generation. I mean, this is a gener generation of of women and young people, not just women, but, you know, young people who have lived in a, in a time when certain rights were just assumed and taken for granted and believed in, and those rights are being challenged. And those folks had not ever had a chance, had not ever had things that were given to them challenged in such a way as we're seeing now. And then, of course, there is the, the voting rights issues that are, you know, kind of traversing around the country uh, as well. I, I'm, I'm not as um, sure what the impact necessarily here is in Hawaii. We're in sort of a sort of a different space at this time because. Um, we're doing all voting by mail, um, and and the sky hasn't fallen. Uh, <laughs> people get their ballots in the mail and send them back. You can go to the polls if you know drop them off, or the polls are going to be open. We did that for the last thing. This, like I said, the sky didn't fall, but um, I don't think that's going to be something that's going to happen in a lot of other places, and and with that kind of ease, but. Uh, those are some of the issues that I'm, I'm seeing. Then the other part, of course, is our justice system itself. Uh, that's a concern to me uh, as a judge, as a lawyer. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, you think about, is it, I mean. Well, well and you shared them. I'll let you guys uh, pontificate exactly. a bit on that, but I, I know it's of concern to those of us who are in the legal field, yeah. And you shared a valuable insight, several of them. One of them being that we're now looking at generations, millennials and those succeeding, who don't just take our word for it of the older generations. And women who don't necessarily take the government or political leaders word for things, when not only their reproductive rights, but their rights to be treated as independent human beings mm -hmm. with agency, with their own autonomy, are not just seriously put at risk, but seriously eroded. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. David, what comes to mind for you as <laughs> rights at risk? Sandra touches on so many things. I don't even know where to start. Um, you know, what am I worried about? I, it, you know, she mentioned our justice system. One thing I'm worried about is the availability of delay in our justice system. Um, you know, thinking about our former president 
and who's adapted the strategy of just, I'll just delay. I'll delay every step I can. Mm -hmm. um, and it's working. It's working unbelievably well. I mean, he doesn't get indicted. He doesn't get tried. Um, you know, what is wrong with our justice system that we can't proceed and prosecute people and bring them to trial? That's that's very disturbing, number one. So I'm worried about yeah. that, the way that people can exploit kind of procedural opportunities to avoid responsibility. Um, and picking up with women's rights, and I'll just take it a step further, all rights of personal choices. I mean, I'm one who believes that once you start down this path, then we better worry about same-sex marriage and all kinds of personal choices because you just kind of step them off one by one and take them away. And I'm concerned about starting on this path and what's going to be next. Then the other thing I'm concerned about is this, this kind of rise in election deniers, um, which goes to our fundamental belief in democracy. And you have legislators actually passing laws to make it possible to throw out election results. Um, if you don't like them, um, we'll just declare them invalid. And, uh, and if you take away the, the, the kind of respect and confidence and believability of elections, that's the end of democracy. And uh, so that's yeah. very important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a really that, that's important a, point. Go ahead. That's a biggie because you're looking at things that are basically kind of going to undermine our faith if we had it in in the uh, electoral system, our faith in, in the judicial system. The judicial part is a real concern to me, David. You raised some really good points. Um, about what is, and certainly how it's being conveyed in in the in the media and the and how the community is seeing how manipulated our justice system is. It always kind of concerns me as well when you're when a decision is reported that instead of it being the judge making a decision that it's a Republican or it's a Democrat or it was appointed by. Trump, the judge was appointed by Obama, the judge was appointed by Bush, mm -hmm. as though that's going to make a, that's going to determine how a judge is going to rule. Now, sometimes we've seen some erratic things, but generally, you know, speaking, you know, as a, as a, as a retired judge, I, of course, we were appointed here, we don't have elections, um, but I don't think, I, I still have a strong belief that Judges don't rule that way. They don't rule on the strength of who appointed. They don't rule on the strength of even any sort of um, uh, political tag, for the most part. Obviously, they're going to be some exceptions. And I find that that continual emphasis is also going in to really undermine people's perception and faith in the justice system to be fair and to be applied equally to all. That's a concern to me. I, I and 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 of, and of course the the ways in which um, the system is being manipulated, I, I think by a former president, is also frightening because it is a method and style that he's using that is clearly not available to hardly anybody. Um, and so when you see that, and then when you're having to a person who's not Trump, who is called to be accountable for their actions. How are you going to enforce that? How are you going to get them to be, to accept accountability if you're seeing this person never has and appears like almost never will? I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case. Even but though that's what's concerned to me. Even though Sanders' worst, worst suspicions I think were confirmed by the district court judge in Florida, um, who I think really, I don't know how you can explain what she did other no. than by the fact that she's a Trump appointee. But by right. the same token, then I'm kind of heartened by the fact that when it went on appeal, there were two of the yeah. three judges who were Trump appointees and unanimously they said that this was wrong. The, you know, the, you know, the ex-president president does not own government classified documents. They never were his documents. Um, yeah, and the idea that the Justice Department can't have access to government documents is uh, it's absurd. Uh, is absurd. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, on the one hand, I'm, I'm I'm encouraged by that, but this whole idea that we've got this checks and balance system, and the judiciary is independent, and it's a check on presidential power and congressional power. Um, 
yeah, that really has been damaged. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is not supposed to be politicized. But when we saw um, Mar Marlick Garland being held off for a year, his appointment saying you shouldn't do anything in an election year, and then someone being appointed in a week, um, and then mm -hmm. you're going to come around and say this is not a politicized entity, uh, that is no credibility. So I think yeah. right now the you're look, people look at the Supreme Court saying that, yeah, this is a political body, and its membership was very much manipulated, and we don't have the same kind of faith in it that we used to have. Yeah. Okay. And this may that. be the first time that we have seen Supreme Court justices publicly essentially debating each other over the politicization of the court with Chief yeah. Justice Roberts saying, hey, we're not political. There's nothing wrong with people just not liking the decisions we made. And Justices Sotomayor and Kagan basically saying, who do you think you're kidding? Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is just echoing millions and millions of Americans or saying, yeah, you, you know, don't try and kid us because we see what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've, we've dealt with, you know, decisions that come out that you don't agree with. That's just the nature. I mean, that's the nature of, of the system. It's you're gonna, not everybody's gonna be in agreement. And so just for him to say that it's the credibility is, is under attack because people don't agree, that's no. No, we, we, we know that. So that's not why. That's not why at all. And and now we have the specter of, of I, I'm not even sure if I want to even say it out loud. It just really troubles me so much that, um, you know, with, well, I'll just go with, you know, with Justice Thomas' situation, it's, it's very, very disturbing. Uh, uh, in a situation, I mean, in a situation where it looks like his wife now is going to be called to testify, you know, with the January sixth committee. It also looks like she has had some um, participation in, you know, urging uh, the Republicans and Trump people to not accept those results. Uh, and now to suggest, I mean, I, I, if you, there's a there's a there's a dilemma here because you know on the other hand, you know she's an independent person. She's certainly entitled to pursue her own activities within their relationships. But he's on the Supreme Court, and uh, he's made no secret about you know some of his points of views with regard to some of these matters. And it's just unnerving to think that there is that possibility that. He will clearly rule or make a decision because he's already done it once um, with regard, without regard to the law, but just basically making a purely political decision. Um, it's happened. So, And, and I, he's, he's already done it. He will do it again. He, in fact, there was a very political case that tried to get Justice Kagan to agree to grant review. She rejected it. The same party resubmitted it to Justice Thomas yeah, and, and he accepted. Yeah. So there's no question. It's whose vote makes the difference. And Justices Kagan and Sotomayor have come right out and said that. It's clear to us that that's true. We don't have a judicially independent integrity-based system anymore, at least at the Supreme Court level, and at clearly at some of the district court levels. Mm -hmm. So David, you're right. It's, it's kind of nice to see that the Fifth Circuit, even with a majority of Trump appointed justices on that panel and on that court <laughs> to come out and really smack down the district judge's opinion as essentially without factual or legal basis. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very, for a limited issue case, it was an extremely broad and strongly worded opinion. Yeah, it was. It really, it really was. And, and 
I, and I think, you know, as you know, you're both lawyers and, you know, you know, judges. And I, I, I was actually really, really shocked um, that the district court actually allowed there to be a master appointed. I, it never occurred to me that that would have happened. Did you think that would have happened? No, I mean, that was just a request by, it was a clear attempt to delay the proceedings because there's so many documents, there's thousands of documents. And if you can require an independent person to review 11,000 documents, it's gonna be a long time since it, before I have to go to trial. I'm certainly not gonna have to go to trial before the November elections. So I win. You know, this is, you know, this is a, this is a win for me. Um, so that was, yeah, that was, that was really disappointing. And I'm, I'm happy that those documents were released. Yeah, yesterday was not a good day for the former president. Uh, not only in the 11th Circuit, which essentially gutted the district court's decision in virtually every respect, even including its remark concerning the appointment of the special master. Hey, with whom Trump's lawyers had a, a less than gratifying encounter last week in their first session where he mm -hmm, expressed mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. pretty clear displeasure and lack of credibility, credibility hey, in their demands and their position. Yeah, yeah, it's just upsetting is people are, they've taken a the position that I can say very extreme things, and I know there's a population out there that will believe it. So I can say things like, in order to declassify documents, all I have to do is think about it. I don't have to do anything. It's like, <laughs> that, that's, that is just, I mean, it borders on insanity. Um, uh, and yet some people will buy, oh, sure, I guess you can. Um, but of course you can't. And again, the nature of these documents are they aren't his correspondence. They aren't his letters. These are government documents. These are government um, documents. They belong to the they belong to the United States of America. They're not right. your personal well, things. You don't get that. You don't get personal stuff in the White House. It's not right. That. To which he had access by virtue of being president, but that didn't give him ownership. It gave him exactly. access, but that's it. Yeah. Well, and that kind of flows into the question about whether any of the tides may be shifting. <clears throat> because there are three things that we know about narcissists. One is that everything is leveraged. Doesn't matter where it came from, doesn't matter how they got it, doesn't matter whether it's even true or not, or even remotely true. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that they're immune. They have no accountability. What they do with it, at whose expense, there is absolutely no responsibility for that on their part. The third thing, however, which may be coming back around to bite the former president, is they will turn on anyone, friends, relatives, family, confidants, yeah. Yeah. right-hand people. We saw that with Bill Barr. He's now figured it out, and he's left the camp. And uh, is Has he really? Well, he he's, has? he's saying things that are very different than he used to say before. Uh, okay. About the lack of truthfulness and the lack of responsibility of the former president uh, or credibility. So, wow. so, what does that mean for us going forward? Well, it means that the elections are incredibly important. It means that we're not as confident in our checks and balance system and that the courts will be there as a backstop in terms of protecting basic freedoms and freedoms of personal choice. We don't know that they're going to be there. And it looks like they're not going to be there. So um, Congress can do things to overrule Supreme Court decisions and can legislate personal freedoms, can legislate Roe versus Wade, but they can only do that if they've got a majority that is in favor of doing that. So these November elections, given how the court has been politicized at the highest level, um, become extremely important. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we all need to participate. Well, and that raises a really good point, David, which is that in the Senate, whose approval would be necessary for legislation to pass, mm -hmm. for judges mm -hmm. to be appointed to the federal courts and for many other things, treaties and things like that, 
<laughs> it takes a supermajority, a 60. Yeah. And yeah. you can carve out exceptions to that, but doing that itself requires a level of majority that is not consistent with the basic majority rule of democracy. And that's Senator McConnell's greatest weapon. And he's not about to let go of it. Yeah, you know, we have to pay attention to our local legislators um, because when we were talking a little bit earlier about um, election deniers, you know, that's happening at the state level. And um, sometimes people aren't as active and attentive to what's happening in their state legislatures as they need to be, because maybe they aren't aware of how much power they actually do have. Mm -hmm. But again, as we approach November, it's not just congressional elections, it's local elections. Exactly. And um, if we if we want people respecting our election results, we want to make sure that people in our state houses uh, think the same way, that they think that elections um, can't be violated, can't be overturned easily, um, mm -hmm. can't be overturned just because I lost. Uh, and we need to be attentive at the local level. That's a good point, Dave. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, go ahead. I, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I know we're, we spend a lot of time talking about Congress and Senate, but what's happening in these in these local elections is really where, as they say, the rubber is meeting the road. And if we're letting some of those folks come through, I mean, we've been seeing, I've even seen some people that are sort of, semi have into acting as though they're deniers even here in Hawaii which is a little bit unusual we've seen a few that have come forth and you know are questioning whether or not well I'm not going to question it but things happen uh stuff happened I don't know if it's true or not and so when you start hearing people do, doing that kind of wavering about the results you're still you're, you're still talking about someone who's really if they're involved in a local election also taking the stance on so in some way to to undermine it so I don't know what happens if these people. I guess if they win, it's okay. But if they lose, it's 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 it was fixed. Is that how that works? <laughs> sure, and that's what they say. But it is before the elections. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. They said before then. They actually say if I win, it was okay. If I lose, the fix. Well, that, was and that's what was that's what was funny in Arizona, um, where the candidates said that this election is rigged. If it turns out the primary, which is Again, a Republican primary, your party's election, you're saying is rigged. Um, and she said it's rigged. And then she ends up winning. <laughs> was it rigged? Said, well, nothing, I don't know. I think it nothing was about that now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's gonna be the that's gonna be the thing. I I I don't I David, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are the probably the most important midterm elections we've seen in a very, very, very long time. Uh, yeah, because clearly control of the House and the Senate uh, are in risk, but also the states that exactly, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, in many states, the people responsible for certifying the validity of the elections with a more secure election system than we have ever had yeah. in our history. The people responsible for that, many of them have quit. They've been intimidated. They've been threatened. They've been not just professionally impugned, but personally impugned. They, their families, others. Yeah. This has been a really a nasty assault. On and you know, and yeah. And we're, you know, and we are in tough times. Um, we're seeing things that we've never seen historically. We're seeing climate change consequences that are ravaging places around the world. Um, God be with Puerto Rico because. Man, they just continue to get hit by terrible storms. Um, and hurricanes are moving towards the United States right now. So we're worried about hurricanes and forest fires and water shortages as water dries up in the Southwest. Um, we're worried about inflation and we're worried about global forces over which we don't have a whole lot of control. We're worried about uh, supply chain for food and energy coming out of Ukraine and uh, coming out of Russia, which is a source of energy. So I've got these huge macro issues that take a lot of our attention. And uh, and so some of these other issues that are going to determine what our lives are like begin to slip aside a little bit. 
and again, I'm going back to the state legislatures, that we're so worried about um, our gas prices and our food prices as well we should be. And we're worried about our water supplies. And you saw what happened in Jackson, mm -hmm, Mississippi, mm -hmm. um, where they couldn't even drink the water, that, um, mm -hmm. that maybe you aren't paying uh, close enough attention to what's going on um, at our local level politically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. And, and some of the folks that are you know, involved in, 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 in running for office seem to not even have a concern, at least the kind of concern that we think is important about these issues. They're more concerned about uh, making certain that everybody doesn't believe in the election, that, you know, the 2020 was rigged or whatever, you know, the 20, so that's, you're absolutely right, David. And so, and what I've also seen is that oftentimes people would volunteer to be a part of, you know, local elections. That's not happening. People don't want, you know, I mean, I've done, I've gone and volunteered at the polls and assisted, you know, with, with elections and stuff. People don't want to, they're not going to want to do that because you're going to be attacked or you're going to be, your integrity is going to be impugned or you're going to have to deal with the, you know, with someone coming up and, you know, doing something untoward to you or your family. And look at the, those, those uh, poll workers who were in Georgia, of course they were being paid, but still to have been subjected to what they were subjected to. Um, when we've got so much, like as you point out, David, there's so many issues really, really at stake. Aside from just how the system, how the election is going to work, we got stuff problems that need to be worked on and solved in in, in our society, and we're, we we can't even take time to do that. You know, we don't have time. Uh, we're short on resources. Mm -hmm. um, something happened in Minnesota. Discovered this week. Um, what they believe is the highest. Uh, or the worst COVID fraud case. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, there was a, an entity set up to feed the children here in Minnesota. They took $250 yeah. million yeah. Yeah. and didn't feed any children. Yeah. And somehow yeah. the money kept flowing. Um, and now they're discovering they bought, they were writing checks for Porsches, um, you know, and luxury cars and buying big homes and taking luxurious trips. Uh, and nobody was stopping it. Um, you know, and again, that's the whole, whole idea that there's so many things happening now that that events are slipping through the cracks and really significant things are 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 people believe I can get away with it, so they're they're taking the risk, and uh, and that's frightening. Well, and you raise another really important point, David, that the media hasn't really spent much, if any, attention on, and that is mm -hmm. to what extent. Does Putin's invasion and war policy in Ukraine and the timing of it relate to his attempt to destabilize U.S. democracy in order to serve the forces of the prior president mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and those mm -hmm. who support him? Well, the, yeah, there's always been that, uh, that quote, friendship um, and alliance, Putin believing that um, the Trump administration would be much more sympathetic to whatever he wants to do than, than uh, another administration would be, and certainly more than, than President Biden would be. So, yeah, that's very, um, you have to, I mean, you, it seems you can connect the dots that. Uh, you can't ignore it. Yeah, that not only, and it's hard to really understand what Russia's interest is here, if it's just really strictly limited to land in Ukraine, it's got to be more than that. I mean, he's got to be thinking about some other benefits he may be getting to this, other agendas he may be serving. Um, mm -hmm. Because beyond that, it's puzzling. And as you may have seen, um, now he's going to start drafting Russians. And I was looking at a map today of all the flights leaving Russia, going to places where people can go without visas. And you know, there's there's not that Whoa. many. Um, former Soviet satellites that can go there, they can go to Turkey, but it shows just a a lot of planes leaving yeah. Russia and trying to drive into Georgia and just trying to get out of the country before they get drafted and sent to sent to Ukraine. So in our last minute, is Sandra on rights at risk. What right would you most like to see vindicated by the results of the 
midterm elections if possible. To be honest, I have to say it's the integrity of our court system. Fair enough, David. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree with Sandra. Um, and my second one is, you know, the confirmation that as Americans we retain the ability to make choices for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think I agree with Sandra that first off, it's really important that we believe that elections are the way we choose our leaders and the way this country survives. Yeah. And, and a lot of that place. does go back to the judicial system because the the protection of those rights, election and election integrity, protection of reproductive rights, all of that eventually falls back to the courts. And if we don't have integrity in the court system, then it's all for naught. And that's a great not just because I'm a prior, prior judge, but that's just I mean, we know how important that is. Hopefully we all share that view. And that's a great place to wrap up for today. Let's see whether we can protect those rights and take back the choices that have been put at yeah. risk. David, Sandra, thanks so much for joining us. Viewers, thank you too. It's good always. Back to see us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.